So welcome to the next in our series of monthly cyber synopsis webinars. Um, for those of you who've tuned in before, or for those of you who haven't tuned in, probably more important, the whole point of these webinars is to give you something to think about, maybe talk about when you get home about cybersecurity. Our rules are to be completely trusted advisor, so we won't be selling you any products or, or solutions on this call. Uh, we won't be talking about brand names, uh, but we do want to give you something that makes maybe the hairs on the back of your neck stand up maybe something that you didn't know about before you joined this webinar and definitely something that will make either your lives, your personal lives, your corporate lives uh, safer and, and better. And I guess to that point, the, today's subject really does touch in, in the personal. Um, we're talking about mental health for the CISO. And it's actually really mental health for the, um, the cyber professional, indeed the IT professional. So we're joined today by uh, Jess Bell from Node4, our own mental health and engagement person. Hi, I'm Jess Bell. I am Node4's engagement partner, which means I look after everything related to colleague engagement, diversity and inclusion, well-being, and corporate social responsibility. Brilliant. Wow, Jess, what do you do in the afternoon? You've got a full job there, so so that's impressive. And I think many of the people who tuned in, like like yourself, are also responsible for compliance across their organisations. So um, so let's dive straight in. Uh, speaking from personal experience being under a live cyber attack is uh, is a stressful thing um i'm only 32 years old it's it's made me this old so uh jess i believe that you know the fight and flight reflex is one of the things that we have in the human condition is actually one of the the causes of mental health and and stress so could you talk to us more about the the fight and flight reflex and and really what what causes the problem that we're talking about today Absolutely, Andy. I think it's important to acknowledge that not everybody knows what the fight or flight response is. Um, so in a moment, I'll bring up an image to explain that. So the concept of fight or flight came from caveman days. Imagine, you know, you're a caveman and you're approached by a bear or a tiger or a lion and your body kind of automatically responds to that. And you can see the fight and flight responses here. Freeze is a relatively new concept, but it's almost you don't know whether to stay and fight, run away, which is the flight. Freeze is almost that numb, oh my goodness, what do I do, panic. So what happens in our body, the fight or flight response gives us an automatic physiological reaction to an event that is perceived as stressful or frightening. And I think the reason I wanted to go through the definition of it is not just for those that may not have heard of it, but that, that word perception for me is really important. What's scary for one person and might cause fight or flight might be different for somebody else. That perception then activates, you know, physical and emotional responses. So the body goes into, if it's fight, things like anger, crying, clenched fists. You can see here, flight tends to be your running away and, and escaping that situation that you, you feel is causing you stress or that numbness where you freeze and you're not really sure on your next steps and in any of these situations the bodily response is to give us an injection of adrenaline and so even if we freeze that adrenaline is just stuck in our body it's the body's response to to stress essentially so, uh, so Jess, what's the antidote to that? Because I, I gather the human reaction would be to run away. So if you're stuck in an office, is the next best thing to go and run around the building twice? Or what do you recommend? I think it's important to acknowledge the impact it can have on your body, even after you've dealt with a crisis type event that puts you into fight, flight or freeze. So the adrenaline will keep going through your body. If you've ever been unfortunate enough to be in, say, a road traffic collision, you'll know that even if you come out unharmed, uninjured, afterwards you can sort of get that spike of adrenaline. So it's about knowing that your body is still responding after after the fact almost and dealing with that adrenaline in the, the best way for you really. It might be to go and run around and burn off that energy. So, so Jess, you know, cyber incidents could last. I've known people work 18 hour shifts. I've known people last longer. And I think there's a lot to be learned from how the blue light services and, and the armed forces deal with, you know, the constant stress of, of combat. But, you know, what are the recommendations? If it's, you know, you're going to be there for an 18 hour shift, clearly ordering pizza is important. But is it literally force yourself to take that 10 minutes or 
hand over control. What what learnings do we have from other people in, in high stress environments that we can apply to the IT and cyber world? I think it is, <clears throat> excuse me, where possible, it is that time out and that allowing your body to adjust and process what's happened. Um, so if I take, you mentioned emergency services, um, I have experience in that area. If we look at how they would deal with that constant state of potential combat crisis, you know, for a whole, a whole lengthy shift, where the most stress is encountered where possible the emergency services will give say a paramedic some time out once the situation is safely closed or come to a conclusion to just process and deal with that as an individual and let their own body as the paramedic recover from that fight flight or freeze response it's not always possible but as and when it is it's good practice for an organisation to recognise that was quite stressful. Let's let the person just have, even if it's just five minutes of downtime. So I guess in some cases, and, and this probably takes a lot, but uh, it's that tap on the shoulder from someone who's nowhere near the thing to say it's time to grab a coffee for 10 minutes or let's let's come out for a breather. So, you know, command's also a lonely place. I guess my recommendation to that would be that probably the the fifth thing you do when you've got a live cyber incident is call the HR team to say you need to keep an eye on us and uh, and, and come in and see us every two hours. But is that a recommendation? Does that work for people? I think it does. And it very much depends on how your how your own brain works. So quite often people find it easier to take that down time if they're instructed to, if they're supported to, if someone like HR or a senior leader steps in and says, Right, whether you want it or not, you've now got 10 minutes because that was quite a serious, you know, incident you just dealt with, whether that be, you know, a cybersecurity attack, whether that be, you know, you've just tried to resuscitate somebody in the emergency services, that post trauma, I suppose, and that post stress time out is much easier to accept and to feel like you have permission to have if somebody tells you that you need to do that. Um, and all of that depends very much on the makeup of your brain. So I'm going to share an image with you now of what some people may be aware of. We have, we all have a brain. We have a left and right side, side to our brains, but it's quite widely known that most people are dominantly led by one side of their brain or the other thinking on my feet one well, maybe the hot tip for today and i've not genuinely thought about this before is that cyber incident happens and it's i, I would never see a disaster recovery plan that says call the hr department when there's a major incident but actually call the hr department to come and check we're okay <laughs> you know bring in the teas and coffees do the pizza force people to have downtime it's, it's probably not a bad recommendation is it no, absolutely not. It, it, in a similar way, call on your mental health first aiders. There might be, it might be that you have someone within your own team that's a mental health first aider or a team that you work with quite closely who's going to be more appropriate than HR. It's just about having somebody that is aware of the pressure that you might be under in the circumstances of a cyber attack and sort of yeah. checking in on you and almost giving you permission. So what I'm what I'm referencing with the brain is obviously we both have both sides but the left hand dominant side so this is where people look at pattern logic they're quite analytical and it would be people that are in careers that are very focused on pattern sequence a very black and white answer and problem solving so in previous organisations, I've seen this to be, and this very much is pigeonholing people. So just take this as a broader overview. Somebody with left brain dominance might be seen to be working in a finance department, in an IT type role, um, in maybe compliance, governance, audit type roles, where it, there is a very structured, analytical way of doing a job and solving a problem, fixing and solutionizing. Someone that's dominant with the right side of their brain is more creative. You might have a team like learning and development, marketing, where you need to be creative in your job role. Um, it's very 
heavily reliant on the use of imagination, feelings, almost a little bit more subjective, um, and there's not always a solution. Clearly, we both have both sides to the brain, but most people, there's all sorts of quizzes online, most people are dominant in one side or the other and led by that side of their brain. And where I think this links to what we've been talking about, Andy, is if you had a cyber attack, let's presume just for a moment that the people in that department are quite left brain dominant. It can be quite tricky for those people to then open up about any feelings that they might encounter as a result of that stress. So they might not mention how stressful they found it in their next one to one. Or even if we, you know, parachute mental health first aiders into support, they might find it difficult to articulate to a mental health first aider how that stressful situation has made or is making them feel. Whereas somebody that was right brain dominant might find it easier to articulate that. So you might have a paramedic, for instance, using our examples on the right hand side that's that finds it easier to talk about that um, emotional and feeling side of things. But there is a really good tool that I can recommend that I've implemented in different organisations. It's an evidence based um, tool that's quite commonly known, but that helps left brain dominant individuals and departments open up that emotional conversation so oh brilliant and and we can always put that in the uh in the chat later but i guess things like uh belbin and temperament sorters those kind of things is, is it worth probably running those exercise on an it team just so you know how the makeup of the team works before the incident yes i think so because obviously on here i i can only sort of make um, broad judgments and, and like I said being quite open around um, some of those where I'm stereotyping but you do yep. tend to find people land in these careers because I don't it's it's the nature nurture debate isn't it but landing careers that are left brain dominant because their left brain is more dominant if that makes sense yeah no um, and, and I guess I'm, I'm allowed to stereotype more than you are um, because I fall into the stereotype Although now I'm looking at the chart, maybe not. But I mean, the cyber and IT industry really is dominated by white, middle class, middle aged uh, males. So does does actually increasing the diversity, increasing the diversity of any team is obviously a good thing anyway. But does that actually help with the left brain, right brain thing? And does it help with the management of stress? You know, without without going too deeply, but do different genders handle stress in different ways? Is the after effect handled better according to gender diversity? I think it's quite commonly known that males find it more difficult to open up and talk. Now, that's nothing to do with left or right brain necessarily, but as a gender, um, they find it more difficult to open up and express their feelings. Females find it a little bit easier. But then when you combine that with which side of their brain is dominant, you know, you might have somebody in an IT department that is very right brain dominant, but that tends to be a small percentage of a whole department, if that makes sense. So to have a mix and to have that diversity is really beneficial because you'll get people, if there's someone in the team with right brain dominance, they're going to think quite differently and I suppose have different suggestions to the majority of the team that may be left brain led. Which can always lead to a bit of conflict, at, at which you don't need at time of stress, but I think it's a good thing. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer and think on record that the whole thing about cybersecurity is out thinking the criminals. And there's a lot of really clever criminals out there. And trust me, most criminals aren't white, middle aged, middle class, or Oxbridge educated males. So to me, diversity is part of the defence as well as part of helping with mental health. Absolutely. Um, so I mentioned I mentioned a tool that might help open up the um, emotional and feelings based conversation for those that are um, left brain dominant. And this tool here is the one that I refer to. You may not call it a tool, it's a measure, but it's evidence based. It's not something I've come up with. Um, it's the stress performance curve. So you can see on the vertical axis, you've got performance. Now you can think of that in 
a work sense, but you can also think of it in terms of your home life. It might be work life balance. It's almost where are you at in terms of how you're functioning on a day to day basis? Performance might not be the right word for you to use when you're applying this to yourself. And then along the horizontal axis, axis you've got different levels of stress and they again they may come from different areas home work um, but what stress are you under and sometimes you won't have control over that stress the important part of this is the curve so you can see it's split up into different colored sections and I won't go on about it too much I'm just going to suggest the model and there's lots and lots of literature around this but where it can be used really effectively with people that are left brain dominant is it's, it can be used as a measure or a marker to open up the emotional feelings based conversation. So as an example, Andy, if you were my manager and I was very left brain dominant and struggled to talk to you if I was feeling particularly stressed or I'd got things going on at home. In my one to one, we could use this measure and hopefully it talks to both of us if we're both left brain dominant because it's, you know, it's very objective. And what I would do is mark on here prior to my one to one whereabouts I think I'm at at the moment. And let's say I mark in the middle of the orange exhaustion section. As my leader or manager, you would also come along and mark where you think I'm at and it. it it's objective, but subjective in terms of it being opinion based. And let's say you marked me at the lower part of yellow. So not quite at fatigue, but, you know, I'm at optimum stre stress. I'm performing quite well. What it would do in an objective way is open up the conversation of why I feel like I'm in orange, but you're perceiving that I'm in somewhere in that yellow so, space. So it's a common it, tax, taxonomy, isn't it? So it's a good question absolutely. because de describing somebody, describing your own pain on a scale of one to 10 is always a nightmare, but having this common taxonomy to cause the conversation and then talk about the deltas is a, is a good starting point, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think probably the, the most important thing for me to mention about this curve is this is the average, you know, the bell curve that we know in so many different ways people's actual curve might be different shaped you know yeah. how people deal with stress might skew that curve slightly but essentially you know you're measuring from the same central measure if you use this in one-to-ones and I've used it successfully with IT teams I've worked with in the past who have found it very beneficial because it it adapts more to their left brain dominance than just saying how are you how are you feeling what's going on that someone that was right brain dominant might be more comfortable with. That is that is too casual to be specific to do anything action orientated about, isn't it? Um, you mentioned it a couple of times and I wanted to come back to it. So mental health first aider. So I'm ashamed to say that until I joined Node 4, I'd never heard of a mental health first aider and then found out it's something that we have lots of people doing and it's it's clearly a great thing. So, I mean, first of all, if you can just tell us what a mental health first aider is, because like me, I imagine many of the audience hadn't haven't heard of it. And then, yeah, if we can apply that to the, you know, if we're building the perfect IT team who can respond to any incoming attack and not get stressed at all and have have downtime, it feels like having a, a mental health first aider close to hand in the team is, is a good thing. So help me with to unpack what, what it is. So mental health first aiders are essentially the emotional equivalent of physical health first aiders. And you probably don't think of physical health first aiders with the physical health in front of their title. But we all know that offices, public spaces have first aiders that if somebody stumbled, fell, split their knee open, a first aider would be called, whether that's in a workplace, a supermarket, you know, they would call the attention of the first aider. That first aider is not going to whip out a needle and thread and stitch up your split knee. They are going to assess you using their training, using their knowledge base and skill set and keep you safe until the appropriate professional support is there, which will differ depending on the, the nature of the query. Essentially, mental health first aiders are exactly the same, but emotional. So if I use a really um, serious example, let's say we encounter somebody that is feeling suicidal. It might be that the person that is interacting with this suicidal person 
isn't a mental health first aider, so they would call a mental health first aider in the same way that you'd get in, you know, physical health first aid. And the mental health first aider, again, using knowledge base, evidence, all of their training and skill sets, won't do the equivalent of whipping out the needle and thread. They are not there to become a counsellor, therapist, crisis team. There are health professionals and specialists for that. They would do the equivalent. They would keep the person safe and signpost them accordingly. And I've obviously used a very extreme example if someone's feeling suicidal. It would be the same if somebody was feeling particularly anxious one day. It's not up to the mental health first aider to fix that anxiety. It would be about signposting accordingly. And that's what the training is for. Within the IT team that you mentioned, so if we had this cyber attack, I would always say that it's a good idea to have a mental health first aider in different roles across the organisation, so multiple. And that's not only to cover things like, you know, absence, annual leave, if somebody's busy and not available, but also so people have a variety of different people to approach. So it might be that somebody in the IT department under a cyber attack might only want to talk to someone that's going to really understand what that means. So they might want a mental health first aider within IT. Similarly, if somebody's going through, I don't know, a marriage breakdown, they might not want to talk to a mental health first aid from their own team or their own department. They might want to keep it very separate but need some emotional support. So they might prefer, you know, to talk to a mental health first aider from the HR team or the facilities team. So I think it's really good to have that breadth. And Obviously, as important as physical health first aiders, we need to know who these people are. It's no good businesses having mental health first aiders trained, but nowhere for us to find out who they are and where they're based and how to get in touch. So, um, so I guess the hot tip is we, we need at least two, probably one in the team and one out of the team for exactly the reasons you you talked about. And and I think the thing I, I also take out of much of this conversation is I think we're talking about you know, during attack stress, but actually removing all of the stress that you can pre big cyber incidents and dealing with post incident stress is, is an important thing. So it's almost like there's a, a stress sandwich going on here, isn't it? And knowing which of those three phases that people are going to be in. And let's face it, people have got different stress points, whether it be an attack or, as you say, a personal circumstance at, at all times. So it, it plays nicely back to that curve, doesn't it? I think that curve's a, a useful taxonomy and a, and a useful tool. I know you spoke about um, suicide, uh, which I, I know many of us have, have seen the effects of that. I was going to say being, being close to people who I think everybody knows somebody who's been in a difficult kind of situation. And I, I think you've told me before it particularly affects the, the male demographic. So, again, did you want to explore that some more? Yes. Yeah, so it's a difficult topic, um, but I think it's a really, really important topic as a mental health first aider myself, but also been in the well-being space. Um, a previous company that I worked for, we did actually experience three colleague suicides whilst I was in the wellbeing role. Um, one of those was actually in Switzerland, where it's interestingly viewed very differently. Um, but the, the two that were in the UK were both male and in what I would call the stereotypical bracket. And what I mean by that is we know that 75% of all UK suicides are male and that suicide is the UK's biggest killer of men under 45. Now I'm going to share an image with you. I feel like I, I should just do a warning for this image because it's quite a stark image. This is an image of um, something called Project 84. Some people might have heard of this but it was developed between the charity called CALM, which stands for Campaign Against Living Miserably, ITV, and an artist called Mark Jenkins. I'm just gonna share this image with you, but it, like I said, it can be um, quite a shock if I don't give a warning to the image. So it's a piece of, they called it a piece of artwork, and this is on the ITV building along the Thames. It was only there, for a very short period of time. This was back in 2018, but I wanted to share it because I think it was so impactful at the time. And the idea of Project 84 is there are 84 statues of men you can see clothed and dressed 
up on that building to represent, and this was the 2018 statistics, to represent the 84 men who take their lives in the UK per week. And I think whether you love or hate the concept of this as a piece of artwork, it was award winning um, because it does its job in terms of getting people talking. When I researched a little bit more into this, each of those models, which is something I didn't realise previously, is sort of sponsored by a family who have lost someone to suicide and is actually represented and dressed as the the person that they've lost. So each of them, if we, you know, if you were to visit those models, they've got names, they've got biographies, and I think on the website you can go and find a little bit more out about each of the models and the families behind them because they are real people they're not just 84 men as a statistic they chose 84 you know actual suicides and actual people with families and feelings um so i think talking about suicide for me it's one of the biggest passions i have from a well-being point of view which might sound a little bit strange but i think it's because it is such a taboo all of my training and all of the evidence shows that the more we talk about it and break the stigma, the more comfortable people are going to feel to talk and to speak up. Um, to repeat the figure, 75% of all suicides are male. That, if I just stop sharing for a moment, that doesn't mean that 75% of attempts at suicide are male. It means that more males complete their intended suicide than females because they use more violent methods. More women are saved from the attempts. So it's it's just to reiterate that statistic is more men complete that suicide, which is a really, really sad fact. Um, but the more we talk about it, the more we can destigmatize it and hopefully prevent and change those statistics in the future. And I guess a personal story without delving too much in the, into the personalities, but uh, a person who I used to work with in, in the 90s seemed like the completely unstressed person, but uh, actually came back to the office one night and, uh, and set the office on fire, which was obviously unfortunate. And I remember the, the police saying to me, but didn't you see the signs? And I think it's a really difficult one. So back to your point that says the more we can get people to talk. But how, how do you do that? So. Uh, I've I've run techie teams through most of my life. So how do you get a bunch of techies and get them to to open up? Do you do it as a group? Do you get your mental health first aider? Do you ask the HR department? There must be a couple of top tips to to make this work. Then clearly I would. Uh, it sounds like I'm going to be bad at it. So I'm I'm in for hearing any tips you can bring to us. What I've seen be most effective in the past, and it sounds really obvious, but it always to me boils back to the basics, is knowing your team as best you can. So what I mean by that is, it's no use me saying to you, oh, well, you might be a team of middle-aged white men, why don't you set up a five-a-side of football? Because if that's not what floats people's boat, it's not gonna be engaging, it's not gonna be useful. Um, that will work for some people, and I've seen it done in organizations. And if you're into football and you want that sport, it does foster sort of conversation and openness with some people. But I think it all comes back to what do your team value? What do they enjoy? Um, what are their passions and interests? Because if you can link socially almost, the more you get to know somebody, I always think of that iceberg model of, you know, they say we only see the tip of the iceberg. And for me, in most work relationships, that's what you see of people within your team. That's what they see of you as their leader. But the, if you can lower the water level a little bit and get to know someone's values or principles or passions, drivers, that type of thing. Yes, it's very useful in a commercial sense, but from a well-being point of view, if you know what drives them, that in itself will help to provide things that you can do to encourage them to talk more, whether that's setting up something like a, a, you know, a football team or a gaming team or whatever that looks like. But even the effort from a leader 
to lower that water level of the iceberg, if it's done in the right way, makes the colleague feel more invested in and more comfortable. The more comfortable you are, the lower the water levels, if you like, the the more open someone's going to be and be able to come and say, oh, Andy, do you know what? I'm going through a bit of a tough time at home. Don't necessarily want to talk about it in lots of depth, but it's just to put it on your radar. You know, I'm struggling a bit at the moment. And that might be enough. You've made me comfortable enough to approach you with that. And that might be enough for you to then just keep a little bit of an eye on me. And no, thanks for that. And are there any learnings from, you know, the military and the the other high stress environments? Because clearly they, uh, I'm, I'm always told by friends and relatives who are in the forces that it's 90% um, ninety percent tedium and 10% terror. And this is that big step function between one and the other. And I know, again, the armed forces are very big into sports and team things, but I, I guess that touches on, on the learnings there. But are there any other learnings from those um, low adrenaline to high adrenaline professions? And again, I guess it's a certain makeup of person that wants to do that kind of thing in the first place. Yeah, I think it probably comes back to the fight, flight or freeze. And what we talked about there around having that decompressed time. So, you know, you're probably ticking along 90 percent of the time and everything's fine. That that tedium you mentioned, that 10 percent of terror. It's about having that structure there, even though it's only 10 percent of the time, having almost a mechanism to kick in. OK, this hasn't happened for the last, I don't know, 90 days, but now we've had 10 days straight of terror or whatever that might be, having a process in place because it's almost easier to miss giving that support when the stressful times are few and far between because you kind of think about it and think oh we should do something we should you know we should perhaps support this a little bit more and then you go in back into that 90 percent of oh it's all gone back to normal now it's fine and then you don't think about it again it's, it's almost easier to prioritize it when it's high stress high stakes all the time um so i think for me the forces and equivalent having something there that kicks in even if it's one percent of the time that one percent is still as important to have that support function that almost something that triggers saying right we need to put this mechanism in place mental health first aid is whatever it ends up looking like for that organization having it there as a plan it's like it's like the emotional equivalent of business continuity planning i suppose and and I guess to that point, and and I think I'm about to rewrite some business continuity plans from, from this session. But it's almost the thing I would take from the military is that they have enforced uh, R and R, rest and recuperation. So it's almost like after a big incident, let's say there's a big incident, just plan that day of downtime or um, offsite time or whatever. And I, I think people just dive straight back into the humdrum day to day, dealing with email, dealing with alerts, and and back to the nine to five. You know, and that's it's not healthy, is it? To to sprint and then go straight back into the marathon without cooling downtime. Exactly. I think key points are leadership understanding of, you know, the fight, flight, freeze, repercussions, R and R afterwards, that kind of thing. Um, so understanding and acceptance and promotion of having that downtime. Um, Something called, well, it, you could call it whatever you want, but I've known it as a wellness action plan. So the, the broad concept of this being an individual knowing what works for them, because what de-stresses me might not be something that de-stresses you. If I went to an aerobics class and had an instructor shouting at me because my rhythm was all off and I wasn't following, as much as that's exercise and endorphins, I don't get on well with being shouted at when I'm already out of breath and uncomfortable. So I would much rather stick a DVD on in my living room and dance around to that and get all the steps wrong, but I'm still getting the exercise. So different things work for different people. And I think people knowing what that is, what is their, it's, it's quite a new, new fan term, but what self-care works for them and, and having that self-awareness is really key. So when your leader says, what, you know, what do you need from me? You know, we've had a really stressful week, day, shift, whatever that looks like. What can I do to support you? For some people, it might be, well, can I knock off half an hour early so I can go for a run before I pick the children up from school? But for other people, it might be, you know, can I 
have Monday to do just these tasks of my workload and then pick everything else up normally from Tuesday. And some people might say nothing, I'm fine. But you can't predict that half an hour for a run won't fit everyone in the team. They won't care. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. And it's almost knowing that somebody has to do that thing as opposed to saying now's your half an hour run solitaire, play back game in time or whatever the heck it is that people exactly. want to do to, to de-stress. No, that's brilliant. Um, so help me with the worst kind of person. There's some kind of people who love adrenaline and the one thing they're waiting for is a crisis. Is you know, is that the right kind of person? Is, is Do those people exist? Is, we don't want a team made up of adrenaline junkies. And again, I guess that goes back to the, the diversity point of view. But is there such a thing? And is it helpful? Um, there, there's I always the phrase, sorry, Jess, before you go that, there's always the phrase of person X responds well in a crisis. They love a crisis. They thrive off a crisis. Is, is that really true? I believe it is. And I think you're right. It does go back to the diversity point. Um, the reason I believe it is is because that's me, that I'm that person. I can be going through my own well-being or mental health challenges, but as soon as somebody else hits crisis or needs something, my body will go into that fight or flight and forget everything that's going on with me and step in for them. In the same way that anyone that's a parent might experience, I'm not a parent myself, but you sort of, you know, if you've got I don't know, D and V at the same time as your children, the children's needs have to come first because they can't yeah. physically care for themselves. So I think there are people that that thrive off a crisis, but I would bring it back to even people that operate really well under stress still need that R and R. They need to know what their self care plan looks like. And you alluded to it when, you know, certain types of people end up in certain types of career. So I could never be, even though I'm somebody that thrives off the adrenaline and the crisis, I'd be an awful paramedic, not just because I don't like blood and all that sort of stuff, but actually just because I wouldn't like the lack of control that it gives me. I couldn't live in that constant crisis response mode. Yeah, you need you need that that to be able to know you've done good for those moments, but not be forcing the adrenaline all the time. Um, yes. And another thing, so we've talked about teams, and when you're you're the top person, the lead person in the team, I mean, command is a lonely place. We probably don't have time to talk about imposter syndrome, which is one of my favourite subjects. But for me, I think that the CISOs I've met when I've talked to conferences with CISOs are dying to talk to other CISOs about the latest thing, the latest threat. And I think it's partly because there's a need to feel it's not just them. It's not just them under attack. But I think commander is a very lonely place. And if you're an IT director or a CISO, whether you're under attack or not, it's a it's a tough place. So what's the recommendations? Is it a peer group? Do you find an external mentor? Um, do you nominate somebody as a second in command? You know, if I, if I take a bullet in the military, if I take a bullet, you're in charge, you carry the flag. Do you do all of those kind of things or what are your thoughts around that? I think probably a mixture of what you've just suggested. The first the first thing that came to mind was that peer support group. So if I think of the equivalent being my role as a mental health first aider, I find it incredibly valuable to get together with other mental health first aiders and go through either anonymous scenarios or even made up scenarios to think about how we would tackle them, share best practice, people think differently, because mental health first aid, as an example, can be a lonely place if you're shouldering, you know, a lot of what can be quite stressful situations and circumstances. And I, I think, therefore, it would be the same. I would recommend, you know, peer support groups and that are optional, but that you've got somebody, um, you need somebody that understands you know, you can always use a mental health first aider, but you're probably going to get your much language more. To know exactly. They need, the they thing, need yeah. to talk your language. They need to understand the challenges you're going to face. Yeah. It's a bit like if you talk to a partner or family member about anything work related, just, to, you know, the daily stresses of that work can present sometimes. They're never going to completely get it as much as if you spoke to a colleague who knows the culture of an organisation and the challenges. Um, and I think when it's so specific to CISO, as an example, it would be really beneficial to kind of 
you're comparing apples with apples essentially aren't you yeah they've got the same the same taxonomy yeah it's um it's interesting i'm a, a big fan of myers briggs and a guy who used to work for me about 15 years ago said you don't understand what makes me tick you keep on sending me on these missions instead of these ones and and i did myers briggs in the team and it was really useful to work out who works well with each other but the hr person who now has a phd in this kind of stuff said to me Andy, what does your wife do? And so she's a nurse. And that's, and she said, I bet when she comes home, she tells you what's wrong with the NHS. And because you're an engineer, you try and fix it. Whereas the answer is to make a cup of tea. So it's almost like for me, using Myers-Briggs has gave you a kind of personal run book of how to deal with, you know, the the most basic of human situations to, to help that through. Um, another point, and I guess you, you've touched on it slightly there, maybe without realising it, but it goes back to my military analogy. I think drilling for these things, so practicing for when something goes bad. We've talked about a BCP plan, a DR plan. Almost nobody ever tests those things as much as they should do, in, in my opinion. But I found that su running a dummy cyber incident or testing the plan and getting in a room and exercising it with people is really great. And the thing I, I've done is get boards in a room where people literally pretend to be on 10 o'clock news and say, and what's happening in this situation now? So they artificially create stress. Uh, in that situation, but in a safe environment. And for me, whenever I've done those, the HR person is never there. So number one, that's a good person to invite in and maybe the mental health first aider. But for me, I think simulating stress before you need it, it builds that muscle memory, it builds that reflex thing. So when you get into the real stressful situation, you've been here before and that somehow creates familiarity and you know de-stresses a wee bit. But so tell me that's wrong, I guess. I don't think it is. I won't lie, it's not something I've ever explored in any detail, but the first things that come to mind are fire drills. You know, that's so that mass panic doesn't ensue an exactly. actual fire alarm. And and we know, you know, they're there for, it's not just something people do for like an hour outside of the office while it's evacuated. You know, they're there for real reasons so that, it's a tried and tested method and, and that continual improvement cycle can be applied if there's any issues that arise from the drills. So yeah. th that's the first thing. I think they're really beneficial. Fire drills happen for a reason. Um, so on that basis, that would be a really good idea. The other thing is from a, and this is, this is coming from a mental health point of view, um, thinking of research I've done in the past on something called graded exposure. So the more you're exposed to it, the better your response is going to be. You know, if, if you go and see a therapist because you're you've got a crippling fear of spiders, and I mean a massive phobia, not like everyone's a bit scared of spiders, but you can't say the word, you can't see the word written down, a proper phobia. A therapist is never going to see you session one and say, right, here's a tarantula, hold your hand yeah, out. Right? Exactly. It, it will incrementally appear in conversation and, and you kind of do it in a graded exposure sort of way somebody who's got a fear of water isn't going to you know they're not going to get them to jump off the diving board into the deep end you you gradually build up um and i almost think there's an element of that to this sort of situation i do like i said it's not something i, I know any of the evidence for in terms of simulating that situation um but it feels like it makes sense. I certainly wouldn't yeah, and, dismiss it as a possibility. And I think this is why I'm looking for metaphors in other forms of life where, where you know, the IT industry has existed for 50 years. The term CISO, I think, has existed for 12. Cyber has been a term maybe for two decades, whereas warfare has existed for <laughs> easily 20,000 years. Blue light services have existed for 200 years and people have done a lot of learning in, in these kind of things. So, uh, so again, I, I think, you know, I've I've met some quite senior police officers who've got to that position because they've understood how to manage high stress teams. I always think just uh, taking a reference point with with other people out there is, is highly recommended. Um, and another tip which is very specific to this industry, so no use for you Jess, but um, there's a book called Whaling for Beginners and when I first found this book and I met the author I said you're going to tell me this is a novel about a cyber attack and it gives me the feeling in the pit of my stomach that we'll get in a, in a real attack. There's now three of these novels and I've always tried to give them to chief execs as they go on a plane so they're nowhere near the Wi-Fi. So read that. Quite a quite a short read, but it it gets people emotionally engaged in the subject. People watch TV detective dramas because they're exciting. Nobody watches dramas 
coming live from a sock. We never see sock watch, do we, on the TV? But you do see yeah. Autobots because it's just not interesting, just not engaging. So the point is, therefore, you you don't naturally drill your brain for these things. When it happens, it's brand new. So uh, so my big tip for everybody is whaling for beginners. Give it to everybody. It gets people engaged in cybersecurity. And I think the more we're engaged in a topic, whether it be mental health, menopause, mental health for CISOs, the more you talk about these things, the more you know that actually you are normal and that this is a normal situation. And then knowing that this is a normal thing allows you to engage all your normal processes, thinking that thinking why is it you and this this shouldn't happen to me is not not a good place to start when you're when you're dealing with the bad stuff happening so absolutely it's extremely isolating so yeah talk about it well jess only only leaves to me to say thank you very much um i've certainly learned loads about the subject from today i hope everybody else has i'd learned about mental health first aiders in in my my day one in node four so hopefully that was that was great for everybody else out there only remains for me to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, our next episode of Cyber Synopsis is we've got an expert on the dark web who will tell you some of the secrets of the dark web, the origins and why it can't be shut down and should we shut it down and all those kind of topics. So uh, so please queue your, your questions up. Now we open the webinar up for questions so that Jess can field any of your questions if you've got some particular thoughts or even things you want to share. Because um, actually, as we just deduced, this is as much about sharing as it is about um, having all the right answers at the right time. Lovely. Thanks for having me, Andy.